Hello folks, this is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 7 of Arrow 3261. Today we're going to be continuing our study into torsion and we're going to focus this time on torsion of non-circular shafts. Let's see how it works. So we saw last time how torsion affects a circular shaft. We learned about <clears throat> what the assumptions were, we learned about how to calculate the stresses and how to calculate the angles of twist. And we saw that the stress distribution, as with the strain distribution, is linear. We have a linear distribution of stress and strain from the center to the maximum radius of the part. Our stress is T R over J, with the maximum being at the surface. Our angle of twist is T L over G J, where the length of the shaft the angle of twist, and we have the G as the property of the material, the modulus of rigidity, and J being the torsional constant, which happens to be the polar moment of inertia for round sections. And we saw how to calculate, we were reminded how to calculate the polar moment of inertia for round sections. Now, if our part is not circular, then we're going to follow a similar but different approach. So this is how our stresses build for circular sections. And if we have a non-circular cross section, we find, you'll notice if you see your shear applied to the member, when we have a circular shaft, no matter where we're at on the circular shaft, any little element, if we have a little element here, we see this torsion kind of can keep going around and around and around the section. If we look at this little element here on the surface and pull it out, we see that we can have this shear stress is met by this one and it just continues through the part going around and around. Now, if we have a, a rectangular section like this one here, we see out here we can get the same kind of distribution of stress, but when we move here, because as we, or each little element is going like this, but when we move here, if we have a unit normal, we find out it's pushing out into the air. The stress can't push into the air, so the stress must be zero here. That causes the stress distribution to be nonlinear there and to be nonlinear here, which is causing this nonlinear and this nonlinear distribution of stress. So if we have a circular section, we're not going to get any distortion of that section. But if we have a rectangular section, the nonlinear stresses due to the wacky shape causes the stress distribution to be nonlinear. So that's the first idea that's different. Now, that's, uh, that causes distortion of our element, and we can see the element twisting. You can see here if you look at this rectangular member, it's kind of like what we're getting is kind of two torques. If you look at a long rectangular member, kind of like we had drawn there, we can see that a torsion like this is going to cause an equivalent couple like this working in the part, an equivalent couple like this working in the part. Now you'll notice if you have a transverse force like this on a thin piece like that, it's just going to bend like a noodle. So it's actually very, not very stiff. But if you look through the center where the thing is thin, these two reacting forces like this, it's very stiff for resisting that. So it's kind of like we can take a look and see our linear or nonlinear stress distribution acting like this. That's kind of the idealization we're going to have. This the numbers and the equations and the way we're going to apply this, it all springs out of membrane theory. But basically, uh, we're going to find we end up with different assumptions as well. Those assumptions we had before, we're going to see that our stress and the strain are no longer linear functions. Our plane sections do not remain plane. Our cross sections are distorted, even though our material is homogeneous, isotropic, and elastic. Now, we're actually going to ignore, ignore all this, uh, even though it's true, and we need to be aware of it, but we're going to ignore it when we come up with these equations. Now, Prandtl noticed way back in the 1903 or something that uh, if you look at the stresses of a 
section in torsion, they're similar, or a non or non-circular section torsion, they're similar to the deflection of a membrane. So a membrane would be something like a balloon. Have you ever seen a balloon? Now imagine we have a square element. Let's say we have a circle, circular hoop, and we stretch a piece of balloon across it. If you put a pressure on it, it's going to have a nice uniform circular distribution. The further from the edge you go, the more deflection you have. Now imagine if that ring were rectangular with that same membrane. You can see going from the middle of this edge to the middle of this edge over here, you're going to get what looks like a linear distribution of or, or a continuous change of deflection that increases toward the middle and then decreases again. And you're going to get the same way this way. But out here, because of the proximity of these two supports, you're going to get a lot less deflection through here. So you're going to get kind of a like a ridged shape to it. Prandtl noticed that actually the equation for the stresses, the way the stresses act in a non-rectangular section are kind of similar to membrane theory. And uh, so not that we're actually going to use that, but that's kind of been used to develop our equations. And he came up, uh, or folks that followed him, came up with these two variants to what we're already doing. We know that for round sections, our shear stress is TR over J, and the angle of twist is TL over GJ. We're going to use almost the same form. We're going to use the shear stress is going to be T times the thickness over J, and the angle of twist is going to be TL over GJ again. Now it sounds like the angle of twist is identical, except that the J, the torsional constant for a rectangular section, is no longer the polar moment of inertia. It's now a different value. And instead of the radius, we're using the thickness in this shear stress equation for the maximum stress. Remember, the stresses are nonlinear. The max value will be T, T over J. So all we need to do is recognize that the shear stress equation is slightly different and that our J's are calculated differently. Let's see how that works. So let's say we have a thin rectangular member of length L, thickness T, and width B. Now, we can say that the shear stress is just TT over J, but I've got a little subscript I because what that means is each flange will have a different maximum shear stress. We're going to need the torque on the total section, we're going to need the J of the total section, and we're going to need the thickness of each and every flange. Now this particular example that I'm showing here, this bar, just has a single flange. It's got a width B and a thickness T. So there's only one equation here. But we'll have to look more carefully for more uh, other sections. So what we're going to do, the torsional constant then, J, and we're actually going to get a torsional constant for shear stress and a torsional constant for angle of twist. And they will be the same if our B over T ratio is large enough and they'll be different if they're smaller than that. So for a rectangular section we can see from this table to the left that the angle, that the uh, coefficient is different than it is for the other. So let's just take a look here. We've got our torsional constant J. Now usually we'll just say TT over J. I'm using a subscript tau to remind us that this is the J for torsional shear stress. And there's also a J for uh, the angle of twist. So for torsional stress, we're going to say that the J is the summation of the alpha BT cubes of each and every little flange of the element. For angle of twist, the J is going to be the summation of the beta for the B T cubes of each and every element. The T, we're going to have TT over J for our stress and TL over GJ for our angle of twist. What this means is we will take a look and identify each and every width and thickness that we need and we're going to go and find the coefficient for shear stress. We're going to get this alpha coefficient. For beta, we're going to get this beta coefficient. We're going to look at our B over T ratio for each and every flange. It's going to range from, you know, something to something. If it's 1, then our alpha is 0 0.208 and our beta is 0 0.146. over 6. That means that our two J's will be different by that difference. If we have a value, you'll notice as we get a larger and larger B over T ratio, the alpha and the beta become nearly the same. By the time we get to 5, a B over T ratio of 5, they're identical. So to make this simple, now what you can do is you'll come here to this table, you'll get your B over T ratio, and you'll read your alpha and your beta. 
Now, if you find a B over T ratio that doesn't fall in the table, you're going to interpolate for the values, not just grab the nearest one. If our value, if our B over T ratio is 5 or greater, then we can use this approximation below where we'll just say that alpha is the same as beta and they're just one third, 1 minus 0.63 over B over T. Okay? So that's how we do it. So let's take a look here for a moment. What this means is for our rectangular section, in this case here, the, the, we're seeing this section up here, we have this rectangular piece, we only have one flange, so our B is this dimension and our T is this dimension, okay? If we'd had a square section, then our B and T are the same, right? And then we have these values for alpha and beta. Let's say we have an angle. If we have an angle section, what we're gonna do is say, okay, going from the middle of this to here, that's our B1. And from the middle of this flange to here, that's our B2. This is our T2. This is our T1. Now we've got a B1 over T1. That means we're going to get an alpha for that flange. We're going to have a B2 over T2. That will give us an alpha and a beta for that flange. We will calculate then the J for this guy will be alpha 1 B1 T1 cubed plus alpha 2 B2 T2 cubed. And the same thing for J except we're using betas. Let's say instead we have a T section. Well now our B1 is going from the middle to the end. That's our B1. Our B2 will be from the middle of here to here. B2, our B2 three, and we've got the t's of each of those. Now we could have also idealized this as our b2 being this whole dimension, and that will give us a slightly different answer because our b over t ratios are different. If we have a z section, what we'll have then is our first b will be from here, the mid plane to here, Second B will be from the middle of this flange to the middle of that flange. Third B will be from the middle of this flange to the end and the corresponding T's. We just get a term then for each of those and that would be our J. And we do the same thing for our J for an angle of twist. That's how it's handled. Does that make sense? Pretty simple. Okay. Now if our... Uh, this is true, so if our B over T ratio is rather large, then our alpha and our beta are roughly one-third. But we're actually not going to use this because we're going to use this equation I gave you down on the lower left where we're going to say if our B over T ratio is five or greater, we're just going to use this form of the equation right there. Got it? Okay. So we talked about this. This is the way we will idolize our section. Now, like I said, you actually could assume that this flange up here, this B1 and B2 are all one flange. That's going to actually give you a little different results uh, than if you treat those two as separate. And usually what I do is use treat each little sub-flange as a separate flange as shown here. That's probably the best approach. If you choose a different idealization, your answer isn't necessarily wrong, but it may not match the numbers that I'm posting and I may need to look at it in order to give credit. Got that? Okay, so we can actually calculate the spring constant associated with that. Since our angle of twist is TL over GJ and spring constant is just T over theta, then we can actually calculate a spring constant for torsion from this formula. There's actually more that we can do for calculating the torsional stability actually just due to torsion alone because a thin a flange uh, section with a bunch of thin flanges will have a really low torsional stability. You can actually get some support by what's called differential bending. I used to teach this in this class, but it's a little bit too much for us, so maybe we'll save that for 230 uh, for arrow 3268 if uh, elective class. All right, let's take a look at a couple. It's pretty simple, 
and it's a close extension of what we've already done. Let's take a look at some example problems. Like let's say we have this little angle here, and let's say we want the maximum shear stress on the lower web. We're gonna need our equation and our J, right? Our J is gonna be alpha BT cubes. So we're gonna calculate using this table here, we're gonna calculate our B over T ratio, get our alpha and our beta for those where we've basically approximated each of these from the middle of the flange to the end point. That gives us our J for shear stress, and we plug that into our equation, we calculate our shear stress. If we want the angle of twist, we will calculate a new J for that, and once we've done that, we will get our angle of twist. Be careful, because this equation, TL over GJ, is gonna give your answer in radians and we're gonna often ask for the angle of twist in degrees. Now 28 degrees is a pretty large angle of twist. That means the thing rotates like this for a relatively long slender angle. So think about this, make sure you understand it. It's a close extension of our the way we're handling circular sections. That wraps up what we have, enjoy.